So I first of all really want to thank Amina Abawaji for her role in making sure that this panel happened. So when the conference was proposed, and people putting in proposals, it was noticed that there was a gap particularly addressing anti-black racism, and so this panel was something that was intentionally put in to make sure that that gap was addressed. So thank you to Adelina and Sheila for recognizing that, and also I really want to thank the work of Amina for bringing that forward as well. Um, I also want to say that Angela Simmons was supposed to be on this panel. She has another commitment, but um, there was a woman as well, you know, speaking. Uh, so she, if you, want, if you need to know about her work, uh, the most important thing maybe that you may know about is the, uh, I can't talk today, North Press and Land Titles paper that she wrote, and that has resulted in a review in the province of that land. So um, even though she's not here, I really want to honor her for her work. Um, before we get started with the panel, I did just want to read you a couple of things. So since people knew this prison law conference was happening, they uh, called me with their own agendas that they thought should be on the agenda. This is people from prison. So I'm going to tell you some of the stuff that they thought that should be addressed, some of which has been addressed, some of which maybe hasn't. Uh, so one black prisoner said involuntary transfers, that he hoped that we talked about that, and he said everything that happens to us when we're black is involuntary, uh, so that the whole construct is involuntary. Uh, he also noted in his file, it says he is not yet a member of any extremist groups. <laughs> so he questioned what that meant, and I said, does that mean, is that because you're talking to the imam, or is it because you're talking to me? Like, which one, is it both? <laughs> which one of that is that? So that was something, also gang membership. Uh, one person in solitary confinement said, I just want to see natural light and maybe a mirror so I can see myself once in a while, and said that you know what I look like more than I know what I look like. Uh, they said, can you talk about the male being photocopied? And black people said that, the, uh, so in, in uh, Burnside and now in other provincial prisons, when you get mail, they photocopy it before they give it to you, including family pictures which come to you uh, with the faces folded. And if you're black, op often you can't even see like the, the faces of anybody at all. And of course, a lot of people now are not asking for pictures because they don't want their kids to be handled, like the photos to be handled, scanned in. They don't know what's happening with those scans and copies, so they're not... Uh, getting family pictures anymore, so they said that. They said, uh, can you talk about the phones, as always, the increased lockdowns and the expansion of lockdowns, uh, the scanners, both the drug and the body scanners, particularly is there a law around refusing the body scanners, they wanted to know. And a couple of other things they said, um, one person said, I boycott the disciplinary process so that every time that they're uh, disciplined, they don't even bother going to the hearings because they said it's a kangaroo court, so they don't bother participating. And one other person pointed out in his file, it says he is the leader of the Afro-Canadian group in the prison. Afro. So those are some of the issues that they brought up around what they're experiencing. So I wanted... I guess I wouldn't qualify. I just wanted to share those as well, and so that some of those we have been discussing, some of them we may not discuss, but I wanted to make sure that their voices on what they wanted to heard was heard. Uh, all right, so I'm Elle, I'm moderating this panel. So going this way, so we have Babu and Bejo. I don't do official introductions, I know Babu. Um, I think he's just an extremely inspirational and amazing person that I'm just happy to have on this panel. Babu will be speaking about his experiences. Uh, next to that, Robert Wright. Uh, who has a kitty pen in his hand. That was my bribe for being on the panel, two people. Uh, so Robert Wright may be most known to people in the legal community through the cultural reports, which I know he'll be speaking about, but also beyond that, um, Robert is just such a force in the community, such a loving force, somebody who tends to our mental health and our needs. Um, when I said, I'm just gonna make you be on this panel, he said, anything for you, sister. So that's the kind of person Robert is, so I'm really blessed to have him. And then Trevor McGeegan, some of you may be asking the obvious question, wait, so this is like a black panel, but like there's a white lawyer? Um, but there's a reason for that, because cultural competency in these issues can't just be on black people, so then we discuss it, and it's like, okay, we're gonna handle it. Uh, Trevor represents a lot of the guys I work with, and I wouldn't send guys to Trevor if I didn't think that Trevor was doing a compassionate job with them. Um, the way that Trevor relates to people, I think, is so important, so I wanted to have Trevor to speak to particularly white lawyers in the room, about what you can do as a white lawyer to treat your clients in the way that Trevor has managed to do. So that's why I wanted Trevor on this panel. So I won't talk anymore, but Babu, I'm going to call you to come up first. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'll talk about my experience I had in Burnside. Um, 
I was uh, detained in Burnside in 2014 on, for immigration detain. Um, I was going through a refugee claim. Um, the way I went through it was, uh, I guess, the wrong way or whatever, but um, I was born in Gambia, West Africa. Uh, I left my country when I was four. I grew up in the United States, in Atlanta, Georgia. I grew up in Atlanta, Georgia undocumented. I went to school and everything. Um, when I turned 18 and tried to go to college, all the citizenship and all that other stuff came up. So I took a flight to Canada. Um, I came across the border the wrong way. I used my cousin's passport, um, but I, I went through. Um, I lived on underground basically for two years. I lived in Cape Breton. I went to school. I tried to do a living there. I was cutting grass. I worked as a janitor. Uh, but two two years of that, I, I wanted more for my life because I was on the route to like going to school, taking pre med, all that stuff, right? To be an anesthesiologist, and I wanted more. So I did some re research and I found the Halifax Refugee Clinic, and. They, they uh, drove me up here from Cape Breton, and um, I told them my story uh, with a couple of fabrications in it to begin. Uh, we did up a refugee claim, and it got filed, and I decided to come out and tell the truth after it got filed. It was a little too late, um, so I had to come back and do the story all over. The only fabrication I had in my original story was the, the fact that I was gay, which I'm not. Um, but in my my country, we had a president named Yaya Jammeh. He was president for like 22 years, dictator guy. The reason why I left in the first place. But he his biggest issue was like he was killing gays, throwing them in jail for life, all this stuff. So I used what was there for me, right? Um, but I went forward with the refugee claim. Uh, I was labeled a flight risk because of how I came through Canada. So I got detained because of that. And, and I got shipped to Burnside. And uh, that whole process took nine, nine months for it to be over. Um, my refugee claim got denied because of the uh, length of how long it took me to claim that refugee claim. Um, I didn't claim it in the U.S., so I was technically not a refugee in their eyes or whatever. But, yeah, I got detained in, uh, in Burnside. When I first got shipped to Burnside, they, uh, I guess if you're an immigrant, they, they put you in protective custody, so they try to put me in the same range with the sex offenders. And... And they put me in there for the first two weeks, two, three, two, three, three weeks till I uh, asked to get moved out. Um, uh, I, got, I got asked to get moved out because of, not because I was around a bunch of sex offenders, but just because of the environment of the range and, and how things were. Um, but I got, I got moved and, and they moved me to, uh, uh, it's not a, a holding cell, but it's like a, lo a lockdown range. So they, they moved me to a lockdown range for like two weeks or whatever. Um, and I had to go through like a process to see which range they should put, put me in. So for that two weeks, I was on 23-hour lockdown, come out for an hour, if I got that hour. Um, uh, yeah, they... I was going through that whole process at the same time too. So every single month I had to go to a hearing that whole night. I was in the jail for nine months and I didn't leave the jail, but every month I would go to a hearing in like a visitation room and I'll sit down with my immigrant immigration lawyer and we'll do a on the phone conference with uh, the, the, I don't know what to call them, see the CBSA people in, in Ottawa. So we'll do a on, on phone conference and and see whether or not I should be released while I go through my process. And each time it got denied, um, I went through the 
refugee claim, it got denied. Uh, I did a pre-removal risk assessment, that got denied. And then I was on de deportation order, and that's when I got released, when I was on deportation order. Um, when I got out, I had to like check in three times a week and stuff like that. Um, but that was four years ago, and now we're, I'm not on deportation order, and I still got to call in three times a week, but I don't have to wear fear of getting deported any day now. Um, while I was in Burnside, though, uh, the it was for me. Um, it, for me, it wasn't like where I couldn't adapt. I had to adapt. Like so, it, when I adapted, it was easier for me. But like just going through like seeing different stuff when I was in there for Im immigration, like seeing everyone stressed <coughs> about going to court or whatever, and getting put in the shackles and. Because every time they came back from court, that's what they complained about. Like, you got to go to admit in, and you got to sit there for at least an hour and a half, maybe two hours before you even get in the truck. And then from, from, from the truck, you got to sit there for another 30 minutes before you even go off to court. And then coming back, you got to do that same process. So you're sitting in that truck for 30 to 40 minutes, and then coming back in the mid and sitting there for an hour, hour and a half and then come back to your range. And, and so, so sometimes for some people when they came back to their range, they didn't even have food, all right? Depending on the time you came, you missed supper. So if you didn't have a good friend or whatever on the, on the range, nobody's saving your, your food. Like they're splitting your food, you know? They're eating your food. And if you bother the guards about the food, you gotta keep bothering them to get some food, right? Um, yeah. Um, I. I was in there, I was in uh, West 3, I believe, yeah, I was in West 3 doing my immigration sentences after I went through the uh, two weeks in the lockdown range, they put me in the open range in West 3, and I was in there with, uh, I, was, I was not charged of any criminal activity at that point. Um, I grew up as an athlete, went to school, you know what I mean? Nothing like that. So I was put in that environment where there was people with first degree murder charges, uh, uh, robberies, all this other stuff, right? So I, I got to know different criminal minds and, 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 and even innocent people. And there was a couple of people that were on immigration detention as well on my range, um, two that couldn't even speak English. So. They, they had a very hard time trying to get what they needed because they couldn't communicate with the COs or the inmates them, themselves, right? Um, there was this, this f f f Philippine guy, um, he couldn't speak any English at all whatsoever. So, like, I tried to help him out, but, like, most of the times, so even for him to get toilet paper, it was a hard thing for him to do, right? Like, just to ask for something like that. Um, but, yeah, like... <laughs> The, in there, like, I don't know, the, the, the COs, they just, like, for the immigrants, as, speaking only for the immigrants, right? For the ones that can't speak English, or it's, it's just difficult for them, right? Trying to adapt to that situation and then trying to get your everyday needs or do your everyday thing or even help, right? Trying to trying to communicate with a lawyer. That was the biggest issue in there, right? My the good thing I had was the Halifax Refugee Clinic. So if I had any questions, I would call them. And but for the other immigrants, their problems was communicating with lawyers. Um, they didn't have a trans a translator to begin with. So if you can't speak English, good luck, right? You don't you don't have a translator. Um, and even trying to get a hold of a lawyer, like they, they give you a list of the numbers there on the phone and it's legal aid or it's, it's all for criminal lawyers, right? And it's very hard to get a hold of any immigration lawyer. So I just put out the Health Factor Refugee Clinic number. Like any, any immigrant that was there and the Health Factor Refugee Clinic got busy because of me while I was in there, right? <laughs> I gave them all their numbers. Um, and they're they're very helpful. They they're multicultural. Like so, even if it's hard for you to speak 
English. They got they they will have someone that can come and speak to you, speak to you in your language. They even tried to come have someone speak um, well enough to me, and <laughs> that's my home language, and I I partially speak it. Right, I can understand it. <laughs> I partially speak it. But when I first claimed for my my. Uh, my refugee thing, I was holding on that I can speak it, right? I'm a very cultured person, so, <laughs> so I gave it a try. <laughs> but yeah, um, you know, uh, it, that, that nine months of like sitting in Burnside and the only time I got to see air was when we got the privilege to go out to the Aaron Corps or the gym or whatever, right? And that privilege wasn't always given to us every week. You know, you're supposed to go out twice a week. And, you know, they like to claim short staff, and, and which some, some, sometimes I understand. You know, um, I, 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 when I first went in there, I was in there for that 14-day lockdown when they were locked down for, four, for 14 days, and most of the times we didn't even get out that whole day. You know, it's supposed to be a 23-hour lockdown. Everyone gets an hour. For that 14 days, I think I got out like once a, once a day, probably five days out of that 14 days. You know, the, the rest I was locked down there for 24 hours. You know, um, but, and that was because uh, I think they were looking for a weapon or something. Someone broke down the, the workout machine on the Aaron Court and they were looking for the piece that was missing. So they locked down the whole jail and it took 14 days to find that piece, right? Um, yeah, like when I first got in there, they denied me my religion. I was I'm born Muslim, I practice Islam. Um, when you go in the admitting, they they're supposed to uh, ask you all these questions, and I don't even recall that being happened with me. But so since I never went through that and told them that I was a Muslim on file, I, I wasn't a Muslim, so it was a big deal for me trying to claim that I was a Muslim and get a halal meal or on a no pork diet. Um, that that took like six months, you know. Like I, I had to go see an imam instead of the chaplain because the chaplain wouldn't, wouldn't pass my, uh, my request for a no pork diet. Um, even with the no pork diet too, like uh, I tried to file a lawsuit against them but I lost the paper so I was on a no no pork diet that whole time, but two two of the meals that they give that they give you on a no pork diet is pork, and, <laughs> and yeah, and and I didn't find this out until I had someone on my range come on the range with a halal meal, and when they were eating their halal meal, I'm I'm looking trying to examine the difference and like my my meat's pink, theirs is all grilled up looking good, and and yeah, I found out that I was eating pork for for nine months, you know, so. I tried to file the lawsuit or whatever, but when I got out, I lost the paper. I was happy that I was out, so it's whatever, right? That that thing's behind me. But like even simple stuff like that, right? Like every time I had that meal, I was wondering why I rushed to the bathroom. You know, um, like fighting for toilet paper. <laughs> that's that's always my biggest issue, right? I, I had to fight for toilet paper. Now at my house, I never run out of toilet paper. Just <laughs> you know, I, I got a stack of toilet paper. And, and that was because nine months I had to fight like for toilet paper every time. And if, if you bother the guards for toilet paper, they'll come and treat you like an animal, literally. They'll come with a bag of toilet paper and just throw it in the air and walk away, right? And just want, they want you to flock there like a bunch of animals, right? Like a bunch of birds or something. Like you can't come hand us toilet paper or put it down on the table and say there's toilet paper here. Nah, you gotta come and throw it in the air. Like <laughs> everyone fend for themselves when I'm the one that asks for toilet paper. So, like that's that was a hard thing to do. Get toilet paper uh, to get any request, honestly. Um, uh, to get dental there, I was trying to get my tooth pulled out. That never happened. I put in a request three three times. That never happened. Um, uh, even to get pro, pro programs, if you're not there, if you're if you're not, you have to be convicted of a crime to be in pro programs there. So to get any type of help, you have to be convicted of a crime. So while you're sitting on remand or on detention for immigration, you can't do any programs, anything like that to help yourself out, right? Um, 
But yeah, like, thank you guys for listening to my story. <laughs> Thank you, Babu. And of course, it's not easy to get up in front of these rooms and have to talk about these extremely personal, humiliating moments. So I really want to honor you for doing that. Um, we ask people to come and, you know, oh, you're the lived expert. And just for us to understand what that means, right, to get up in front of the room and talk about toilet paper in front of people. So thank you, Babu, and thank you for your analysis. I'm going to ask Trevor to come next. Thank you. Um, before I start to speak, I'll just preface my comments by saying that my perspective is not as an academic. I don't have any uh, stats uh, to offer you on this topic. I don't have lived experience, as uh, Elle noted. I'm white. <laughs> uh, very kind words from Elle. Uh, thank you. But I think that she chose the whitest uh, person that she could find <laughs> to be on this panel. I am like translucent, I am so, <laughs> so white. But my, my perspective is as a criminal defense lawyer, I've been so for roughly a decade in this province, so I've represented black accused, white accused, and that is uh, the experience I am offering. And I could probably spend a lot of time, as probably other defense lawyers, if they're here, I know I've seen some talking about what we see as a disparity in outcomes for uh, black accused versus white accused in terms of trials, in terms of sentencing, in terms of bail, crown positions on sentencing, on bail, and overall treatment of black accused in the justice system. But I, I do want to give uh, just a few examples. I won't uh, take up too much time. But uh, one case uh, that was last year, uh, 2000, or 2017 case from our uh, Supreme Court called Redden. It's a reported decision. Actually, has nothing to do with race at all. It's a, an older gentleman, a white accused, who is charged with possessing uh, 18 firearms in his home in a rural area. Um, handguns, shotguns, uh, rifles, 7,000 rounds of ammunition. Mr. Redden was on a prohibition order. He uh, had a prior related conviction. I think the prior conviction was actually for shooting someone. I'm not positive on that, but that's my understanding. Uh, Mr. Redden pled guilty to these offenses and ultimately received a community-based sentence, a conditional sentence order. And I'm not suggesting Mr. Redden should not have. I'm glad he should, didn't go to jail. I don't think he should have. Many shouldn't. But the, the reason I bring up that case is because the, what I see is that a similarly situated black accused may have a lot of difficulty receiving that sentence and making that same argument that his lawyer made on his behalf. I mean, if I were, you know, if I had an accused and I'm saying, well, yes, they had 18 firearms, 7,000 rounds of ammunition, they have a prior related record, they are involved in their community. Also, I'll back up, Mr. Redden, some of the evidence that came out of his sentencing was that he was a historian, he played the bagpipes, he made wine and beer in his spare time. So. Great. I mean, that, those are great hobbies for Mr. Redden. But just imagine if I'm, if I'm arguing, well, listen, yeah, I have a client. He has 18 firearms. He's black. He doesn't play the bagpipes, but is into all sorts of other music and perhaps is a hip-hop artist. Am I, is my argument going to have the same effect as the argument did for Mr. Redden? I don't think so. I really don't. You know, and there's, there's other examples, uh, too. Bail examples, I had a case not that long ago, my client uh, charged with a serious crime, a shooting, but had no record, and the case, and I know I'm his defense counsel, but it is, was a weak, weak case, objectively weak, and the Crown was opposed to his release, not, not even on any type of condition, on house arrest, nothing, they were opposed, they wanted him detained. And I don't know, for sure, I guess, that that Crown Attorney would have had a different position were that a white accused. But I have seen enough of this over the years to justify my belief that the position may be different, that they may take a different position. So in this <coughs> province, in this HRM, 
If you're a black accused, you have a particular last name from a predominantly black community, there is, I think, an assumption and a bias that you are someone who is somehow entrenched in the criminal subculture without evidence of that fact. And that influences, I think, how a Crown may look at a file when that person is before the court, at sentencing, at trial. It's there, and I've seen it, and I've seen it again and again over the years. And again, there are many other examples I think I could give, but I won't spend too much uh, time on that. Another, uh, one example I do want to talk about is not exactly a, an outcome, though that's, that's part of this case. It was a, a murder charge uh, several months ago. Uh, my client uh, is a black young man. Um, the deceased in the case was a white young man. Uh, throughout the course of the trial, there was some media reporting about my client. It was during the testimony of a material witness, and a couple of journalists in the courtroom were live tweeting and, and writing about it, and were consistently describing my client as staring at the, at the witness when he was on the stand, which, I mean, he was looking at the witness. It's, it's his murder trial. I don't know. He was doing other things, too, but... Um, so that happened, and L wrote about that as well. Um, same trial, the, this was during jury deliberations, the family of the deceased uh, were present throughout most of the trial, but not present during, there were several days of deliberations, they were not there for most of that. And the Crown Attorney, outside of court, to a journalist, presumably, I wasn't present, but presumably this was off the record, it wasn't certainly reported, but in earshot of my client's family and my client's uh, supporters, said that the family of the deceased were not present because they had been intimidated by my client's family and my client's supporters. I know that that's not true. That was not true, completely not true. Same trial, um, this was again during deliberations, the jury had a question, the jury came in, and one of the sheriffs walked over to my client's family and my client's supporters and admonish them for looking at the jury because I guess the feeling, at least for that particular sheriff, was that they were somehow intimidating the jury, just looking over in their direction when they came in. So that, that's all the same trial. So there was a theme in that trial of just black people just doing nothing but being there. They were just existing, being present there and there were these, these accusations. That was apparently a problem, just being present throughout that trial. So part of the, I think, reason L asked me to be here too is to talk about, well, what can lawyers do to deal with issues of race and racism when representing black accused? And I don't want to pretend that I have all the answers uh, to that question. I certainly uh, don't, but I can talk about perhaps what, what not to do, which may seem uh, obvious, but one example is from a case a few years ago, a court of appeal decision called Frazier, where the evidence on, the fresh evidence on appeal was that the defense lawyer at trial was representing a black accused. He was charged with a sexual assault. The, the uh, alleged victim of the sexual assault was a white person. And the, the client had expressed some concern to the lawyer about uh, racism. And despite that, the lawyer had not even advised the client of their right to challenge for cause, the ability to challenge for cause. It was a jury trial. Uh, Parks challenge to challenge for cause on the issue of race. They had not even told the client about that. So that's an obvious example of what not to do. The court of appeal, I don't think, was too happy about that uh, failing. Uh, another example of what not to do, I had a client tell me once that he, with a previous lawyer, had had some questions about race, had some questions about racism, challenge for cause, other, other issues related to race that he brought up to his client, had some concerns, and instead of responding to those concerns, the lawyer said, maybe you need a black lawyer, which obviously don't do that. I know this seems <laughs> <laughs> like it's not particularly profound for me to say, you know, listen to your client, give a shit about their case, sorry for, I don't know if I'm allowed to swear here, but... <laughs> But I, I think that maybe sometimes um, that there is a lack of humility with lawyers occasionally, that they... Um, <laughs> I'm 
trying to be, you know, just uh, not, not too strong in my language there, but, but just the approach that I'm the expert, I know what to do, I got this, don't worry, and that's not a particularly helpful approach with any client, but if you are a white lawyer and your client is a black person, I think it's particularly important not to be like that, because you can't know what their life is like, you can't, you won't. So all you can do is listen to them. Just try to incorporate their perspective into your own. Try, if the circumstances justify, to tell their story as best you can, and for example, at sentencing. It, again, I know I'm just saying listen and try to understand and, and try to hear them. Uh, and again, that, that doesn't sound particularly profound, but I think there is a lack of that sometimes in representation of black accused. Um, I also think, and I know Robert will talk about um, cultural, race and culture assessments at sentencing, that's becoming more common uh, in Nova Scotia, which I, think, which I think is a good thing. I know there's an Ontario uh, case recently where that was also done that Robert was involved in. Um, and I'd be interested in talking about this topic. Uh, I don't, we don't have a lot of time to dig into this uh, for the purpose of this talk, but just the, the potential for at least being open to that as counsel, um, and even in cases where it's not practical to get uh, an actual assessment done, because that takes a lot of time, it takes money, it's not every case that you can, can do that, but that doesn't stop the lawyer from, again, talking to their client, trying to gather information, listening to the information they have, talking to their family, talking to members of the community, and trying to tell the court about their identity and about their background, you can, of course, still do that in the absence of a race and culture assessment. I think there may be room for expert evidence uh, regarding race and culture at trial as well. And again, I, I would be interested in talking to people about this uh, afterwards if, if people want to, but just some thoughts I had on that. For instance, in a self-defense type of case, if, if your client is uh, arguing self-defense and per, an argument the Crown may have, you know, well, if you were truly threatened, if you had been assaulted in the past, if you were afraid of this person in the weeks leading up to the event, why didn't you call police, for instance? Well, the answer to that question could have a cultural component that mm -hmm. I think there's room there for expert evidence on that point. You know, why did you go to the scene at all? Why did you even attend the scene you knew this person that you're claiming you were afraid of was there? I think there's room in that type of factual scenario. After the fact conduct, you know, if you didn't do anything unlawful, if you did nothing wrong, you're claiming, why did, didn't you stick around the scene? Why did you flee the scene? Why, did it, why were you avoiding police? I think, I, I'm not aware that there's been expert evidence called in these types of situations. You know, and I, maybe there's challenges in terms of rules of evidence, and again, I'd be interested in talking to defense lawyers if they want to about that, but um, calling, a, calling a witness, a non-accused witness, uh, to provide exculpatory evidence, and that witness has not cooperated with police, you know, perhaps has refused to cooperate with police during their investigation, but comes forward at trial and provides helpful evidence for you. You know, maybe their credibility is being attacked on that basis. Well, if you had this helpful evidence, why didn't you come forward? Well, th there could be a cultural component to why they chose not to do that, and surely they can answer that, but it may, there may be room there uh, for expert evidence. You know, hopefully not. I mean, no one has an obligation to, to, you know, speak to police in those circumstances, but I've had judges say all citizens have, quote, an inherent obligation to assist police during their investigations. I've had judges say that, believe it or not. So, have mercy. Uh, you know, there may be... Anyway, I think I'm finished uh, talking. <laughs> Thank you very much for having me. Thank you, Trevor. And I will say that Trevor does more than listen to his clients. Um, maybe he doesn't, maybe this is just a component of how he listens, but I know from people that have had him representing them, they feel that they're part of it, like he will give them the law if they want to read it over so that they feel that they're active in their own defense, and I think that's been really important in empowering people in a very powerless process, um, just feeling that they can ask those questions about what's going on. So I will 
big you up for that, Trevor. Um, finally, I'd like to invite Robert to the microphone. I'll bring my kitty pen. <laughs> <laughs> it's a totem now. Uh, well, first, I'd, I'd, I'd like to thank Elle for inviting me to be here. And uh, the, this brother lives by a maxim. And that is, when the sisters call, the brother responds. Yeah. And if you understand, there's some cultural uh, uh, components to that. Uh, but I think it's a good uh, maxim for all uh, male-identified persons to live by. Just, uh, you, you, we'll talk about its benefits a little later. Uh, um, so, I think we're just going to, there we go. I think that we're going to put... Why is that not happening? There we go. So, That's going. Excellent. So um, I didn't prepare a PowerPoint slide uh, for you, but I decided I would put a couple of uh, websites up here just to aid me in the conversation a little bit. So uh, Elle asked me to come and talk a little bit on this panel that is about anti-black racism in the criminal justice system and in prisons. And um, I guess my, my, my question is, is that still a question? Is there anybody in the room who is not convinced that anti-black racism exists in the criminal justice system? I'm just wondering about my audience. Is that anybody? <laughs> so, um, so I guess really what we're talking about is how do we talk about anti-black racism in the criminal justice system? And how do we then argue about it in a way that uh, is substantial and leads to the kinds of things that are necessary to deconstruct anti-black racism in the criminal justice system. Well, this uh, first, this is just a slide about me. Um, uh, uh, that's my website, robertswright.ca. I'm, I'm imminently Googleable, and uh, some of the things that I write about and talk about are. Um, on my website, almost every PowerPoint I've ever produced is there. So if you uh, wanted to take a look at some things, there it is. And there's a rather fetching picture of myself there, so <laughs> if you wanted to look at that. So we're in Nova Scotia. So when we start to talk about systemic racism in the, in the criminal justice system, there are some places that we can go. And I always like to start the conversation, although it really doesn't begin there at the Donald Marshall Jr. Uh, process, uh, Royal Commission on the Wrongful Conviction of Donald Marshall Jr. And I love this because in the very opening paragraph of this, uh, of this um, commission, the commission says, the criminal justice system failed Donald Marshall Jr. at virtually every turn, from his arrest and wrongful conviction for murder in 1971 up to and even beyond his acquittal by the Court of Appeal in 1983. So even beyond his acquittal, the system was dealing with him with systemic racism as a factor in his dealings there. Uh, the uh, tragedy of the failure is compounded by evidence that this miscarriage of justice could and should have been prevented or at least corrected quickly if those involved in the system had carried out their duties in a professional and or competent manner that they did not is due in part at least to the fact that Donald Marshall Jr. is a native. So in Nova Scotia, Royal Commission has on paper acknowledged that systemic racism was a substantial part of the, re the result of Donald Marshall Jr.'s outcomes. Not just his arrest and wrongful conviction, but everything that followed after that right up and including after his acquittal. And one of the things that people forget about the Donald Marshall Jr. case is that though Donald Marshall Jr. was a, uh, 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 a Mi'kmaq individual, the person who was murdered in that case was a young black man. Right. And so not only did Donald Marshall Jr. not receive justice, but the victim of the crime, a black man, did not receive justice. And so we have to ask ourselves the question, had the victim of the crime in that case not been black, and had there not been an aboriginal person around to blame on that crime, would the matter have gone radically differently? And I think that the conclusion has been, history has suggested, yes, it would have been a different conclusion. 
So when I think about anti-black racism, I, I go to the next thing I think about just naturally. And again, um, there wasn't a lot of, of uh, scholarship put together. This is a conversation that I've been invited to, and I'm, I'm here to kind of share in the conversation. I go to the RDS case here in Nova Scotia, and this is just a, this is not the actual case, but rather a, a reporting on it that uh, John Tatry did in, in 2017, how a national crisis showed the value of a black judge. And uh, there's a little uh, description of that case here somewhere. A dramatic example of that happened in, 19, in the 1990s. A white Halifax police officer arrested a 15-year-old black boy known as RDS in legal documents. We still refer to him as RDS, though he self-identifies. The police officer said the teenager had interfered while he was arresting a different black boy. The police officer said RDS hit him with his bike in an effort to free the, the other boy. RDS said he did not touch him but was arrested for speaking up during the arrest. What was the national crisis? The national crisis was that the black judge believed that the black boy's story was credible enough to raise reasonable doubt for the case to be dismissed. Well, you would have thought she shot someone in the courtroom. The National Chiefs of Police called for her removal from the bench. And the case was appealed and was argued right to the Supreme Court in which, uh, where her judgment was held. And some very important Judas jurisprudence came out of RDS. So, does anti-black racism exist in the criminal justice system? Well, perhaps it does. Certainly, when a black judge acknowledges the possibility that certain interactions between police officers and young black people are characterized, you know, that, you know, the story sounds credible, I understand these sorts of things happen. She was very gentle in her comments. She was accused of racial bias. I think the I think at the time I think it was the first black the first judge in Canada who was uh, uh, so accused. Not to suggest that white judges before had not been uh, engaged in in racial bias, but uh, her case really rang a bell nationally. So does anti-black racism exist? Well, I don't think I need to convince you there. So then I go to the OCI report, the Office of the Correctional Investigator 2013 report. One of the things the OCI did was to have a special section in that report on diversity in corrections and did a case study on the experience of the black inmate. Um, and, uh, and so that... Uh, was in 2013. I was a member of an organization that we had founded as, as a result of some other things that we don't have top, time to talk about, the African Canadian Prisoner Advocacy Coalition that was a kind of an ad hoc group that hung together for a little bit in response to some questions. Anyway, we were asked to do the, the literature review to support the OCI study in 2013. And um, I guess what I would say is that, uh, of course, the OCI study um, showed a, a number of things. Um, I will just say this, that we understand anti-black racism does exist in the criminal justice system. What does it result in? It, in, it results in and is uh, evidenced by increased policing in black communities, increased encounters between black people and police here in Nova Scotia. We're, uh, looking at the street checks data, and currently there is a study that is being led by our Human Rights Commission to see uh, whether or not the street check encounters that black people have with police, um, just to see, unpack uh, the systemic racism that is evident there. This, of course, results in increased arrest, disproportionate sentencing, increased time in classification units, even when incarcerated, resulting in reduced time for programming, and, uh, and then, of course, once you're in general population, decreased programming opportunities, decreased effect when programs are taken, increased disciplinary events, increased time before release. So uh, black people who are arrested and adjudicated and spend time in jails tend to spend more time uh, 
in jail before statutory release or before early release than their white counterparts. So all of these things are evidence of anti-black racism. Oh, and by the way, black inmates who are released have reduced recidivism rates to their white counterparts. So that evidence suggests that the way they were treated throughout the criminal justice system is really not uh, in keeping with the nature of their risks. So all of that is stuff that I've been theorizing about for about 25 years or so, and, uh, and uh, so theorizing about these things uh, results in a lot of good, good con uh, but eventually someone has to do something. And so um, probably about um, a decade ago or so, I started uh, uh, writing reports for lawyers who would come to me and say, I've got this black inmate, what do you think? Is there something you can comment on? I would write these reports. And I think the reports were just really trying to articulate uh, some of the uh, ways in which anti-black racism shows up in the lives of these often young men who were before the criminal justice system. And uh, I think the initial reports that I r read, r wrote uh, didn't see the light of day in court, but might have been used by lawyers to argue with, uh, with Crown prosecutors and the like. But then came the uh, RVX case, in which a young black man shot another young, well, they were boys actually, a young, another young black boy uh, in the middle of the day. Long and the short, uh, the prosecutor was wanting to um, sentence the young boy as a, uh, an adult and uh, was looking for quite a severe sentence. And the lawyer came to me and I wrote a report and the long and the short of it is that uh, Judge Ann Derrick was able to find uh, in that report um, something that allowed her to see the person who was being adjudicated from a slightly different perspective and was able to uh, uh, sentence the young man to a youth sentence. So that was the, the case, and it, um, it, because it was a youth case, though it did get a little bit of press, perhaps it didn't get as much as it should. But since that time, here in Nova Scotia, these reports have become a, an accepted part of the tools that are available to the court, not to defense attorneys, but to the courts, to help the court arrive at just sentences for black uh, uh, accused, black uh, uh, convicted uh, individuals. And so that's something that we have been doing here um, in Nova Scotia since that time, which is, I guess, 2014. And um, I, I think as was noted, I was involved in one case in Ontario. They have had a second case in Ontario. Both cases were before the same judge, and both judgments have uh, resulted much like RVX in very eloquent and insightful written decisions. So if you haven't read those decisions, I'd encourage you to do so. Uh, the assessments are really, uh, that's just a couple of things I'll say before I sit down and then perhaps we'll have an opportunity to have conversations. Uh, let me just ask, how many people here are, are lawyers? Just by show of hand, just so I get a sense of the... Uh, okay, how many people here are are um, credentialed mental health professionals. Okay, so we have some mental health professionals. So, um, so some of us who are expert witnesses go to court and we write these assessments. And one of the challenging things with being an assessor is that your job is not to be an advocate. Your job is simply to assess objectively. And so as uh, wonderful as my report might be, it is only as useful as the lawyer can make it. And I've been assessing things, I've been a forensic assessor for, I don't know, 20 years, and I have done a lot of work, risk of violence assessments, parental capacity assessments, sex offender assessments, now these cultural assessments, and I have had Fantastic lawyers adduce the evidence out of my reports, and I have had not so fantastic lawyers attempt to ask me simply, so you did that report, uh, what did you find? 
Um, I'm sta on the stand, kind of dumbfounded. Well, um, <laughs> I guess my point is that this work can't just be done on the, on the backs of the uh, expert witnesses. The, the witnesses still need to be uh, examined by competent lawyers. The other thing I would say is that, as uh, was suggested, that the, the assessments perhaps are not always necessary. Certainly now we're getting enough decisions. There's a developing enough jurisprudence to acknowledge and make good arguments for uh, the presence of anti-black racism in the lives of individuals and uh, to steer uh, uh, jurists to make decisions that are designed to, uh, to arrive at good decisions. One last slide I'll show you and then I'm going to slide, sit down. There have been a, very, a couple of very interesting cases in the United States where superior courts have come to this conclusion. Right? There have been cases in which on a scene, police arrive and black people flee and police give chase. And those persons have been found and sometimes adjudicated uh, or, or been chased down and, and uh, arrested, sometimes even found to have drugs on them, sometimes found to have uh, weapons on them. And in at least two very interesting cases that I've been tr tracking, uh, the judges found that um, a black person running from a police officer in certain contexts can no longer be considered a suspicious act. A black man who runs from police shouldn't necessarily be considered suspicious and merely might be trying to avoid the recurring indignity of being racially profiled. That's an interesting thought. Thank you, Robert. Your brilliance is always just the brilliance of Robert for our community is so important um, and his breadth of analysis. So thank you. We have some time for questions. Let's you know, keep it short. Go ahead. Uh. I have a question about Trevor. I was here in 1988, but I, I assume there has been maybe some, but there certainly is not many in Nova Scotia. There are, there are the overwhelming majority of lawyers, criminal lawyers, seem to be white and frankly white men. But I mean, there certainly are there are some, so I don't know if they um, we have increased maybe in private practice one practicing black uh, lawyer woman. That's it. <laughs> Like, there's some people at Legal Aid, but very few. Ray Cash? Um, I just wanted to add to that, that especially in Ontario, there is a, um, a study done in the Arts and Sciences Department in 
If I could just say, yes, there has been an increase in the numbers of black and indigenous lawyers, in part largely to the indigenous black and Mi'kmaq program that exists here at the Schillick School of Law. Uh, and we have been increasing the number of uh, trained lawyers who are black and indigenous. But if anti-black racism exists in society and is affecting people who come before the criminal justice system, it's also affecting people who come to law school. And so, as the sister suggested, that there are some barriers to uh, those individuals coming to, to law school. And, uh, and so that difficulty in finding articles, even when you do fire, find articles, difficulty in the higher backs, uh, those kinds of things. Black lawyers, indigenous lawyers, starting their careers as sole practitioners when really, you know, uh, that's not the safest place to start your legal career. And then, uh, after a legacy of, oh, I don't know, more than 20 years of this program, uh, uh, and they're beginning to be a critical mass of uh, qualified black and indigenous lawyers who have been before the bar for uh, significant periods of time, our provincial government changed the policy in terms of how long a, a, a lawyer had to be before the bar be, uh, it, to be eligible for a, a provincial judicial appointment. So that policy shift right at the time where there was a critical mass of indigenous black and, uh, and uh, aboriginal lawyers, to me, was a clear evidence of anti-black and anti-indigenous racism by the system that at one time argued there's no qualified blacks or natives to appoint to the bench, and then when there was, we changed the bar. So uh, there are some challenges, but yes, we do have more uh, black and indigenous lawyers, and they're doing a bang-up job. Go ahead, Debbie, I know you want to. Um, so I just want to extend from what you were saying, Trevor, about um, lawyers listening. I actually believe it's a lot more than that. As white lawyers, white people in this world, we have to address our whiteness and our privilege and unpack that and how it impacts on people of colour. And to do the work that we do as criminal defence lawyers, we must do that work. Otherwise, we will never be able to represent anybody who is a person of colour. And that's fundamental because we're actually doing a detriment in um, representing me. Thank you. Go ahead. Uh, just back to the point about um, sort of black people as represented in the legal field, I just want to encourage all of you to read an article called Black on Bay Street. Uh, it's Black on Bay Street by a young lawyer named Hattie Roderick. It's about a year old and it details her experience in, um, in big law in Toronto in a supposedly post-racist uh, industry or society. So emphasis on supposedly. We have time for one more question. Go ahead. Um, I, I just wanted to pick up on um, Robert's point about the um, eligibility for appointment to the bench, and Robert's quite right that uh, in about 2009, the NDP government raised um, the eligibility um, to 15 years from 10 years at the bar, which was disproportionate to the number of years you had to sit at the bar to be eligible for a federal appointment as a judge. Uh, that has been changed back, mm. so it is now 10 years again for the provincial court. Yeah. I'll also add that we don't have counsel of choice through legal aid anyway, so you can't actually request the black lawyer <laughs> because we're allowed to. So, and uh, my understanding is that they've been cracking down on that more lately, probably because of austerity issues. So even if you want a black or indigenous lawyer and you're with legal aid, you can't just request it. Um, thank you, everybody. Thank you so much to the panelists. And thank you, everybody, for giving up your lunch hour to listen. And thank you, Adelina, for making sure this happened. And Sheila.